Hi there, Guy from Bugs and Stuff and GiantSpiders.com. So 2021 marks my 33rd year of keeping tarantulas, and after breeding many species over that time, I am particularly pleased with my recent success in breeding one of the hobby's most iconic species, Brachypelma homori, or the Mexican red knee. They're probably the best known of all tarantulas due to their docile temperament and bright colours, and I've had this species in my collection since 1992, and I've tried twice in the past, unsuccessfully I have to say, to breed them. During 2018, I was lucky enough to actually go to Mexico for a month, and this was to photograph and film many different Brachypelma species for Andrew Smith's lovetarantulas.com documentary Brachypelma, the Red Leg Tarantulas of Mexico. Having managed to find them in their natural habitat, I was inspired once again to try and breed them in captivity once I got home. So my adult female is currently around 10 years old. I've tried to breed Brachypelma homori in the past, but they always end up molting without producing any egg sacs. This time around, I decided to approach it differently. And this meant giving the females a cooling down or winter period to try and get them to lay eggs. My female molted on the 3rd of June, 2020. And at the beginning of October, I purchased an adult male from Virginia Cheeseman. It's always a risky business buying adult males as you can't always be sure of their condition. Some are too old or infertile, for example, but Virginia assured me that the male was still active and producing sperm webs, although she couldn't tell me the date of his last one. So I successfully paired them on the 20th of October, 2020. It was a textbook mating with the male using both pulps several times and with no aggression from the female. In the coming weeks, she was fed regularly, but not excessively. We're often told that after mating, females should be fed as much as possible in the weeks before egg sac production, but I didn't do this with this female. In their natural habitat, females mate in the fall, become less active over the winter months, and then begin producing egg sacs in the spring. Lots of captive breeding reports recommend a cooling down period to replicate the winter months to stimulate egg sac production. Well, I say winter, but winter in Mexico is nothing like here in the UK. And temperatures out there average still at around 15 degrees Celsius. Well, in Mexico, I discussed this with a local breeder and he said that temperature changes definitely happen in nature, but in captivity, he was more successful, not with temperature change, but mating followed by a period of normal feeding and then a period of not offering any food at all. Finally, a period of heavy feeding to stimulate the natural increase in prey that would occur in the wild during the spring. He said that an increase in prey was a definite trigger for egg sac production in his experience. So taking all this on board, I used both methods, cooling and increased amount of prey in my attempt. So on the 17th of January, 21, 89 days after the mating, I moved the female to the cool area. So my spiders are kept in a converted garage attached to the side of my house where the main animal section is heated to around 26 to 28 degrees Celsius. But the attached kitchen area is unheated, so I chose this area as my cooling area. Average temperatures in this section were around 21 to 23 degrees Celsius. So no food was offered during this cooling period. Water was always present in the water dish, but no water was added to the substrate. The box she was in was mostly covered with a towel, so she felt secure, and the substrate was a 50-50 mix of coir and sand. On the 9th of March 21, after 51 days, she was moved back to the warm area, and the box remained covered. I dampened the substrate a little, and feeding resumed. Breeding reports recommend a progressive warming over a few weeks, but I just didn't do this. Her container was simply moved from the kitchen area to the animal area overnight. Although prey was offered more regular, sometimes daily, the female wasn't overly interested in feeding. She had noticeably gained weight during the cooling period, but her lack of appetite on being warmed up was surprising. On the 30th of March, I decided she needed rehousing. Her original container wasn't really suitable for building an egg sac, so she was rehoused into a larger rub style box to which I added lots of pieces of cork bark, half flower pot hide, a 
covering of leaf litter and a slightly deeper substrate. Again, her box was covered so she felt more secure. Average humidity inside this box was around 65-70%. to 70%. On the 22nd of April, 184 days after being mated, she began to build an egg sac. She used one of the half flower pot hides and it took about 24 hours before the egg sac was complete. The box was then placed on a quiet shelf and remained undisturbed, but I did check it approximately every two weeks just to make sure there was no mould inside the box. Now most of the time I prefer to leave any egg sacs with the females during incubation and I chose to do this with this one too. A lot of people will remove an egg sac for artificial incubation after about 30 days, but despite the risks of leaving it with the female, for me nothing beats seeing an adult female surrounded by her spilings, so I rarely remove them. On this occasion though, I did remove the egg sac after 76 days. I chose to remove the egg sac as I was going away for a week and felt it was the best option. The egg sac looked good from day one and I had a feeling it was healthy as the female had cared for it for so long. Infertile or bad egg sacs are often eaten or discarded. So I removed the egg sac on the 7th of July 2021, 76 days after being laid. On opening it, I was pleased to find it full of mobile nymphs and only a small bit of hardened mould which was removed immediately. This was the remains of their eggshells after their initial eclosion. The nymphs were split into two and placed inside two round tubs lined with a cupcake case and a fine net covering. They were then placed into a larger box lined with a piece of damp kitchen roll and a secure lid with ventilation holes. This box was then placed into a Lucky Reptile incubator and maintained at approximately 27 degrees Celsius. Humidity inside the incubator remained at around 70%. A word of warning, if you use one of these, make sure you add additional thermostats as the incubator's reading can often be different from the actual temperature inside. Over the next week or so, there were a few nymph deaths and mould had to be removed a couple of times, but generally everything went fine. Around five days later, the first nymph started to show dark urticating hair patch development. And after a further five days, the first darkened nymph molted into a fully mobile spiderling. The other nymphs molted over the next few days. And about a week later, I separated nearly 600 spiderlings. So there you have it. A successful breeding of one of my favourite spiders, Brachypelma homori, or the Mexican red knee. Hopefully this information will help anyone else out there trying to do the same.